Hi, welcome to the weekly worship of the First Church of Squantum. My name is Doug Gray. I have the great blessing of being pastor to, to this amazing bunch of people, and I'm excited to have the chance to share worship with you today. There are some great things happening in our fellowship. One of those is that this week is Vacation Bible School Week. We're doing it in the evening from 5.30 to 8. And if you're in the area and you'd like to uh, have your kids or your grandkids or your neighbors be part of that experience, they can join any day of the week. We'd love to have them. One of the things we're in the process of doing is uh, enjoying our spiritual coaching with the greats. Part of our series this week is Evelyn Underhill, and if you would like to receive the packets that we're handing out each week for folks to read, just uh, respond in the comments and I will be sure to get you some, wherever you are today, whenever you are watching this. Our prayer is that you would enter into this space and find that God is with you. Enjoy. Oh, good morning. On behalf of Jesus Christ, welcome today. On behalf of the members of this fellowship, it's good to have each of you here today, and it's good to have those of you who are joining us online as well. Boy, we have a really chock full day today. I'm so excited about what God is doing in our midst. In fact, the biggest thing this week is Vacation Bible School. I am so excited about Vacation Bible School, not just because there are weird animals and I'm weird, but because everything is falling into place. And Tina, do you have anything you want to say about uh, Vacation Bible School coming up? Oh, it's going to be great. Thank you for all the work that you've put in. I know you have a leader's session following worship today, right? So that's great. Of course, Vacation Bible School is in the evening this week, so it's 5.30 to 8, and that means, hmm, no Bible study. <laughs> so if you were thinking there was Bible study, you have a pass on that. But you can come and help at, at Vacation Bible School instead. Uh, it also means that uh, in the evenings here, things are going to be very busy. So if, if you would like to come and just kind of see what the fun is, this is one of the best things we do all year long as a fellowship, and I'm really excited that we get to do it this year. The other exciting thing happening today is, as you noticed when you were coming in, we have benches. The Boy Scouts made these incredible benches, and I see we're joined by the, the, the Scouts back there. Thank you for making time to come and be part of this. Thank you for the benches. We're so excited about this. After worship, we're going to do our lemonade hour. I don't want to false advertising here. It's not coffee hour today. It's lemonade hour. It's gonna, we're going to do it outside so that we can officially welcome the uh, benches into the, the church's uh, into the church's ministries. You can't believe how many people have already stopped to look at the benches. It's really great. So we're, we'll have just a little bit of a ceremony following worship uh, and a ribbon cutting ceremony. And I'm looking forward to that. 
Are there other announcements I should be making I haven't made quite yet? Yes, Tina. So we're doing a backpack drive for Oh, yes, thank you. Is there a, a list of supplies? Yes, there is. You can come see me and I'll give it to you. Okay, good. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, the Venmo, yes, and there's also a Venmo with uh, the church, which a lot of people in the community have already donated to, which is marvelous. We love Venmo. It's an easy way to get it. Our Venmo address is First Church Congregation. No, First Church Squantum. <laughs> First Church Squantum. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I'm so glad we did that. You know, we had, we had some members who helped us get signed up for it, and it's really great. Thank you. Well, with that, let's begin our worship of the living God by, uh, you know, all right, so I'm gonna, I am going to say this. I know the CDC guidelines changed, so, but we, we are not, I didn't have time to talk with you about it, so I'm going to wear a mask just because I think it's the right thing to do, and I'm around people. But you don't have to today because we, we weren't prepared for that. But if you'd like to wear masks, I have a stack of them just outside. So it's not a have-to thing. It's an if-you-want-to thing today. But next week, I expect it'll be a have-to thing. Uh, we, I just haven't had a chance to talk with the deacons and get that ironed out. All right, so very good. Well, with that, let's begin our worship of the living God by standing to sing our heart-opening song, more precious than silver. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Accessible, hid from our eyes, the class. 
with our opening prayer. Lord, we come with so many needs. Some of us are sick and in pain, or love someone who is sick and in pain. We have tough decisions to make, and we come to seek your help with those decisions. Our families are not all you want them to be, and we need help. We have so many needs, yet amid all our questions, pains, and trials, we have one great need, to be near you, to know your will for our lives, to love you as you love us. Come near to us, Lord. Speak to us, even if what you have to say to us is different from what we expected. We long for more of you, even as we pray, as Jesus teaches, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand as you're able. seated. I have a new song for you guys today. It's called Keep Making Me. I think sometimes we feel like we should already be arrived at perfection. And so when we're not perfect, we just kind of... <laughs> Nobody, Siri. Thank you. I'm going to have to change that setting. Um... Speaking of not being perfect. <laughs> and so what I love about this song is it reminds us we're still in process. And that some of the things that are happening in our lives are part of that process or can be. Maybe they're opportunities for us. So it's called Keep Making Me. Oh, and if you're looking for it online, it's by the Sidewalk Prophets. There's a, a band name for you. All right, are we ready? Here we go. Make me broken so I can be healed. Cause I'm so callous and now I can't feel. I want to run to you with heart wide open. Make me broken. Let's do that again. Make me broken so I can be healed. Cause I'm so callous and now I can't feel. I want to run to you with heart wide open. Make me broken. Make me empty so I can be filled. Cause I'm still holding on to my will And I'm completed when you are with me Make me empty till you are my one desire Till you are my one true love Till you are my breath, my end Lonely, so I can be yours. 
For the new Lord is in the darkness I know you'll hold me Make me lonely Till you are my one desire Till you are my one true love Till you are my breath, my everything something new. We have an opportunity now to worship God, not only with our, our hearts and our lips, but also with our gifts. If you're a guest with us today, you're under no obligation. It's grace that you're here, and we think Jesus would be just happy to see you. So if you're not under any obligation to give. If you feel like you were moved to give, that's a different matter, and we leave that in your hands. Let us bring to God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
While Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens, he saw that the city had statues of false gods everywhere. This upset him. He held discussions in the synagogue with Jews and converts to Judaism. He also held discussions every day in the public square with anyone who happened to be there. Some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers had discussions with him. Some asked, what is this babbling fool trying to say? Others said, he seems to be speaking about foreign gods. The philosophers said these things because Paul was telling the good news about Jesus and saying that people would come back to life. Then they brought Paul to the city court, the Areopagus, and asked, could you tell us these new ideas that you're teaching? Some of the things you say sound strange to us, so we would like to know what they mean. Everyone who lived in Athens looked for opportunities to tell or hear something new and unusual. Paul stood in the middle of the court and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious. As I was going through your city and looking closely at the objects of your worship, I noticed an altar with this written on it, to an unknown God. I'm telling you about the unknown God you worship. The God who made the universe and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in enshrines made by humans, and he isn't served by humans as if he needed anything. He gives everyone life, breath, and everything they have. From one man, he has made every nation of humanity to live all over the earth. He has given them the seasons of the year and the boundaries within which to live. He has done this so that they would look for God, somehow reach for him and find him. In fact, he is never far from any one of us. Certainly, we live, move, and exist because of him. As some of your poets have said, we are God's children. So if we are God's children, we shouldn't think that the divine being is like an image made from gold or silver or stone, an image that is the product of human imagination and skill. God overlooked the times when people didn't know any better, but now he commands everyone, everywhere, to turn to him and change the way they think and act. He has set a day when he is going to judge the world with justice, and he will use a man he has appointed to do this. God has given proof to everyone that he will do this by bringing that man back to life. When people of the court heard that a person had come back to life, some began joking about it, while others said, We'll hear you talk about this some other time. With this response, Paul left the court. Some men joined him and became believers. With them were Dionysius, who was a member of the court, and a woman named Damaris, and some other people. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For centuries, people have searched for the Holy Grail. 
that fabled cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. Around it has gathered all manner of powers and ideas that drinking from it can heal someone, that it is so holy only the pure of heart can find it, or my personal favorite take, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. In a sense, the idea of the quest for the Holy Grail is one that has been around forever. But we see it still. For example, this week I've been re-watching the Marvel movies and ran across Ant-Man again. How many of you have seen Ant-Man? Oh, you're missing out if you haven't seen it. It's very funny. So in this movie... The hero's quest, Ant-Man's quest, is to gain access to his daughter who lives with her mom as part of a custody arrangement. For Ant-Man, the holy grail is this relationship with his daughter. In our passage for today, we encounter others who are seeking the holy grail in their own way. And like with most quests for the Holy Grail, their quest is about to take a strange turn. Let me just give you some setting, some context. If you walk down the streets of Athens in the first century AD, you would have been struck, like Paul was, by how many gods and goddesses there were. In his book, A World Full of Gods, Keith Hopkins imagines what that might have been like. There were temples and gods and humans praying to them all over the place. At the entrance to the town, at the entrance to the forum, there were altars at crossroads, gods in niches as you went along with passers-by just casually blowing a kiss with their hands to the statue of a god set in a wall. And of course, in the forum, the ceremonial center of the town. There were temples, altars, gods, heroes, just about everywhere we looked, to say nothing of statues of emperors and of local dignitaries on horseback or simply standing there impressively impassive in marble. Why so many gods and goddesses? Did you ever ask that question? As it turns out, the ancient people of the Greco-Roman Empire were not really sure what to do to make it to the afterlife. Being a good person, a, a virtuous person, was great, but many people thought of religion as an insurance policy. If you worship one god, fine, but just in case, why not sacrifice to as many as you can? on the off chance that maybe a god they don't know is the one who would get them into the afterlife. The Athenians even have an altar to an unknown god. So we ought not to be surprised to hear Paul say, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. What's said to me, maybe to Paul too, is that for all the gods and goddesses, for all their sacrifices and prayers, they are still searching for the one who can fill that empty hole in their hearts. For us, maybe, it's not so different. We worship all the time. We head to the ballpark with an almost religious fervor, hoping that the Red Sox will win today. We pay homage to learning with libraries, bookstores, and universities as the temples. We sacrifice our money in the temples of technology like Best Buy or in temples of video games like GameStop. We buy tickets to hear our favorite band or singer, and we go crazy when they sing our favorite song. We have ATMs in little niches like shrines, so we can continue our retail worship when we run out of cash. We study the principles of investing, trusting they will guide us to freedom and fulfillment. Instead of knowing ourselves as made in God's image, we try to make God 
in the image that we want. So many places, so many ways we create idols to worship. What's worship anyway? Louis Giglio, in his sweet book on worship, called The Air I Breathe, says, Worship is our response to what we value most. That's why worship is that thing we all do. It's what we're all about on any given day, because worship is about saying, this person, this thing, this experience, this whatever, is what matters most to me. It's the thing I put first in my life. And whatever is worth most to you is, you guessed it, what you worship. Oh yes, like the Athenians, we are really religious. As long as it doesn't get too serious. Like the Athenians, we are always looking for something inspirational. Something that makes us feel good, but not too demanding. And the saddest thing about our time is how hard we work at worship without finding real fulfillment. In the movie Ant-Man, there comes a moment when the hero must make a choice. To save his daughter, he must risk losing himself in the mists. As he floats in the mists, unsure of what to do and how to escape, he hears his daughter calling him. Daddy, where are you? She is the one he seeks. And he learns that she is looking for him too. This is the plot twist that comes out of nowhere in our search for meaning. Here we are searching for God. But what if the unknown God is looking for us? Calling out to us. Where are you? C.S. Lewis recognizes our search for God and this plot twist when he writes, an impersonal God, well and good. A subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside our own heads. Better still, a formless life surge, life force surging through us, a vast power which we can tap, best of all. But God himself alive, pulling at the other end of the cord, perhaps approaching at an infinite speed, the hunter, the king, the husband, and that is quite another matter. There comes a moment when the children who have been playing at burglars hush suddenly. Was that a real footstep in the hall? There comes a moment when people who have been dabbling in religion, humanity's search for God, suddenly draw back Supposing we really found God, we never meant it to come to that. We're still supposing God had found us. And that's the ironic thing about our search for God, that we make all these idols that fail to meet our needs for a relationship, idols that fail to care for us when life has gone to heck, Idols of consumerism, technology, and pleasure that fail to know we even exist. And all along, God is searching for us. What if Jesus is the sign that God is alive and wants to know us? And so we pray, not really knowing what to do or how to do it, perhaps. Still, we launch our inner selves heavenward, only to 
find we misunderstand this reality too. Evelyn Underhill writes, Prayer stretches out the tentacles of our consciousness, not so much toward that divine life, which is felt to be enshrined within the striving, changeful world of things, but rather to that eternal truth, true love, and loved eternity, wherein the world is felt to be enshrined. And that's the difference. Instead of thinking about spirituality as a piece of our living, we begin to understand that living is a reflection of our spirituality. And then everything changes. In their search for God, the Athenians will try anything new and intellectually stimulating And in our time, there is always something new and hip that tells us it's the next real Holy Grail. Evelyn Underhill suggests that our minds can only take us so far in our search. Reason comes to the foot of the mountain. It is the industrious will, urged on by the passionate heart which climbs the slope. Isn't the whole idea of searching to find? What if in our search for God we took a moment to be still? To open up to the reality of grace we see in Jesus. To let God, who is searching for us, catch up to us. What would change in us if we were to stop searching for God, stop working so hard to get God's attention, and turned to find God with his arms open wide? And then what? Amen. Our communion hymn today is number 612. In this very room, it'll be on the screen too, but some people like to look at the music. Let's stand as you're able.
Thank you. You may be seated. In a moment, we will begin our ceremony for communion, the Lord's Supper. For those of you who would like to partake, you're welcome. It is not a have-to thing. And if, you, if that's not your thing today, even if it's today and maybe another day you'll decide differently, that's fine. It, this table is set for all of us in this space, and we are all invited. It's set for us. Yes, we, human hands set it today in this presence, but this is not my table. It's not our church's table. It's the Lord's table. And Jesus is the host here today. And he invites anybody to this table, whether you're a member of this church or another church, even if you're a member of no church at all, but simply desire to have more of God in your life, to participate in this mystery in which we are joined with him and with people all over the world and all through time who have also celebrated this sacrament, this mystery. We are invited to this table not because we have the answers, but because we have lots of questions. We're not invited to this table because we are... We have the faith of the saints, but because we have doubts and faith mixed in together, and some days maybe we're more doubt than faith, still, we are invited to this table. We are invited to this table not because we have it together, but because in Jesus we might find a way to become more the human God made us to be. So won't you come to this table and find the one for whom you have been seeking? Amen. As you might gather from my invitation to the table, I find I, I come very humbly to this table because I don't feel like I have answers and I often have doubts and questions and and so, could we pray together a prayer that reminds us of how humbly we are before God today? It's a unison prayer of confession that you'll find on the screen. Let's pray that prayer together. We confess, O oh God, that we sometimes settle for filling our lives with things that do not satisfy or endure. All too often, we try to jam activity and busyness into every corner and moment, and still we find ourselves empty, anxious, and hungry. And so we come to you. We come having heard those whispers of the bread of life and fruit that will last. We come wondering if those promises of never hungering and thirsting again could possibly be true. We ask your forgiveness. Nourish us with your grace. Empower us for your service. In the name of Jesus, who is life's bread and overflowing cup. Amen. Dear friends, in a world with all sorts of bad news, I want you to hear some good news today. When we are humble and come before God confessing our sins, He is faithful and forgives us. The good news is this, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. For Jesus died for us, Jesus rose for us, and Jesus reigns for us. Amen.
I'd like to invite the deacons forward. share with you today as it was shared with me that on the night when our Lord was betrayed he sat around a table with friends just like we do today and after dinner he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his friends he said take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, remember me. And in the same way, he took a cup. And he gave it to his friends. He said, take and drink, for this is a new promise, a new relationship in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink this cup, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth my death until I come again. Isn't it a mystery that Jesus would serve his friends even knowing one would betray him? And isn't it a mystery that the one who is broken makes us whole? And isn't it a mystery that the one who emptied himself is the one who can fill us? These are the gifts of God, the children of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. I am the bread that came down from heaven.
the body of Christ broken for you. May it make you one with each other and with him. who is thirsty won't you come to the waters and you that have no money come buy and eat come buy wine and milk without money and without price why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, a relationship, my steadfast, sure love for David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So much to be thankful for, my friends. Could we just take a moment to live in an attitude of gratitude? Let's pray. Before we could ever turn to you, O oh Lord, you were looking after us. Before we even opened our eyes this morning, you were there. You have brought us into this day, and it is gorgeous, and we are so thankful. You have placed us in community 
there are people who love us and whom we get to love in return. How thankful we are, O Lord. We ask that you would hear our prayers for our lives and our community and our nation. But we ask in gratitude for we have received blessing upon blessing from all those things. We thank you especially today for the knowledge that as we have gathered in your name, you have been with us. And as we go from this time and space, that you too will go with us. And so we thank you for that, for the knowledge that we can love better because you are in our lives, because we can be better children and parents and grandparents, better neighbors, because of our time with you. Thank you, God, for the chance to draw breath and feel joy and know that wherever we go, you will too. We give you thanks and praise, honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, who is our hope and our friend. Amen. Our closing hymn today is a great gospel hymn. Number 630, if you like to look in your hymnals, it's what a friend we have in Jesus. Not too slow there, Clara. It's not a sad song. <laughs> Let's stand as you're thinking. What a friend we have in Jesus.
So let us join together in our unison benediction to pray for each other as we go here. Let's pray. Let us go now. And as we go, let us remember. We haven't just been to church. We are the church. And when we are truly the church, then we are the presence of God to each other and to the world. So let us go into the world and be the church through the transforming love and power of the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Go with God.